post the link in the chat so my slides are already available as um, PDF on Zenodo. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk to you today about finding small molecules and their metabolites in big data. Um, and yeah, I'm on Twitter as well if you want to follow what we're doing. Uh, thank you very much to Sammy uh, for the introduction. And uh, let me just make sure things are moving. Before I'm going to start into my talk today, also thank you to all of those who have helped to make this happen. Their names no longer fit on my title slide with our new template. Um, but this is a huge thanks to my group, uh, to our many, many collaborators, uh, specifically for this uh, talk, the uh, headshots here. Um, and I'll be showing what they've contributed all the way throughout this slide. Uh, and as you'll gather, uh, as I talk, it's been a lot of community efforts over the years. So there are many, many people behind all of this work. Uh, it's actually been a real pleasure to be in the lineup together with uh, both Nessa and Barbara, who I've uh, seen on Twitter. Uh, uh, Nessa was mentioning a lot of uh, LCMS, so I do LCMS as well, but in a completely different way to her. So, and Barbara's uh, name is turning up in this talk. So uh, Barbara, keep your eyes out. You'll see your name happening a few times. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something Nessa already mentioned a few times, FAIR. Um, so I'm going to give a quick introduction and background so we're all on the same page with terminology because I do very different stuff to what a lot of you probably do. Um, I'm then going to go through identification and chemical space um, with uh, introducing you to two resources, METFRAG and PubChem Light for exposomics. I'm going to give you a little case study that we've been applying in Luxembourg, so the LuxPest uh, case study that Jesse uh, led in my group. And then uh, where does AI come in? This is obviously a series on, uh, on AI. Um, then I'm going to do a little bit of uh, finishing up about dark matter that are in our samples and transformations, and then finally some take home messages uh, if you, I haven't overwhelmed you all with uh, colorful slides by then. So my group looks at environmental cheminformatics, and you might well be asking yourself, what is environmental cheminformatics? This is just the infographic from our website. Um, we look at the environment, take various samples, um, interrogate these with high resolution mass spectrometry, uh, then we process the data using lots of cheminformatics methods, and the ultimate aim is to identify chemicals and their toxic effects in the environment. And we have a large number of use cases, which is why I'm being relatively unspecific about the use cases for now. Um, what's key to our research is that the high resolution mass spectrometry is basically the workhorse. This is the way we get the fingerprint of the chemicals that are in the environment. Uh, and our challenge is really connecting the signals that we see in high resolution mass spectrometry to the chemical knowledge uh, to generate insights and outcomes. And if we look at the current state of knowledge, if we use the methods, obviously depending on the samples, um, we can identify hundreds of known chemicals in our samples, but we're still confronted with thousands or more often tens of thousands of unknown peaks in these samples. And this is the challenge that I'm really trying to solve. So if we want to look at these uh, unknowns, we then uh, start interrogating a whole lot of cheminformatics resources out there and trying to connect the chemical knowledge to the signals we observe. I'm going to go through these one by one uh, in the subsequent slides, but we have, for instance, Norman suspect lists. This is um, a collection of expert knowledge where people uh, are storing lists of pharmaceuticals or pesticides so that you can look for them in the samples. We have mass spectral libraries, which effectively store the fingerprints of known chemicals. Um, the open mass spec libraries that we can access have around 227,000 uh, um, chemicals in them now. We've got the collection like PubChem Light for Exposomics, and I'm going to go through how we created this. Uh, we're at about 380,000. Comtox Chemicals Dashboard is around 900,000 chemicals. PubChem, about 111 million. CAS, not on this slide, 180 million. And if we would try to generate all the structures or even try to calculate what chemical space is, it's basically we can't calculate those numbers, it's just too huge. So somehow we have to connect our tens of thousands of unknown peaks to the tens of millions of chemicals out there and potentially their transformation products. So this is where our big challenge with metabolites comes in. If we would even put PubChem Light, so a 380,000 collection through Biotransformer, which is one of the most comprehensive predictive systems out there, uh, at least in the open space, then you can see we're already in the millions to tens of millions range, uh, depending whether we've got human reactions or environmental or a combination thereof. And if we would then take this uh, even one step further, then we're already uh, approaching the size of PubChem just with a two-step transformation. So if we were trying to whack uh, the entire PubChem through this transformation, you can start to imagine what kind of numbers of chemicals we're dealing with. So we use non-target high resolution mass spectrometry to measure our observations and then try to capture or try to connect the chemical space with what we're actually observing. 
I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but you can have a whole lot of different sampling campaigns. There are a large number of questions uh, we're trying to answer, water treatment, just routine monitoring, trying to find out more about transformation in lab experiments. We can form sample archives. So you uh, archive the sample and then over time we'd analyze them. Or after analysis, you can also form digital archives so you can start to do trends, uh, um, but have the sample measured as soon as you retrieve them. And we have a whole lot of data pre-processing, prioritization and identification steps. Um, there are several open source workflows out there. I, there's no way I can cover all of them in one talk, but I particularly like to um, highlight Patron, which has been done with, uh, um, by Rick Helmus uh, in uh, the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's got one of the most comprehensive open uh, source workflows out there for environmental uh, applications at the moment. And he integrates this pre-treatment, uh, chromatographic peak detection, cross-analysis and grouping, prioritization using uh, many, different, um, many different methods, um, and then finally the annotation and the identification. Uh, anyone who knows my work so know, knows I'm pretty much always focused on this last point, the annotation, um, but all of this preliminary work uh, is uh, a huge part of what we do as well. Um, so we have published this article in Journal of Cheminformatics earlier this year. And as you'll see on my slides right at the end, we've actually just published uh, version two in uh, the Journal of Open Science, uh, Open Source Software. Uh, we haven't published it, we just submitted it. So um, this has been uh, just a fantastic way for Rick to connect all the open source methods out there and try different ways of publishing this as well. Uh, we're also developing our methods in-house. Uh, so we've developed Chinese Green, uh, which is in a way a much simpler um, approach than Patron. Um, it's also been designed uh, by our then interns uh, following master students and now research and development specialists with the team. Um, they were our first generation of students and then designed a, a software for our teaching uh, together with our R3 team. Um, I'll go into this a little bit later because this is what Jessie applied in her um, LuxPest series. We've also been working hard to contribute uh, to mass spectral libraries so that we've basically got the fingerprints of the chemicals out there. Um, I've been involved with MassBank uh, ever since we had MassBank Europe in 2012. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've also, since I've been joined, uh, since I've joined Luxembourg, we've been able to uh, contribute uh, a large number of records, uh, specifically focusing on exposomics chemicals. So we've had the first organometallics, as far as I'm aware, um, that have ended up in MassBank. And here you can see the nice fingerprint we get. Um, and this was Anjana's master's thesis, and she had a talk earlier today presenting uh, her work at the Dickens Symposium, which was really nice. Uh, so she's actually the um, fifth largest contributor in MassBank at the moment. Um, we also do a lot of uh, gathering expert knowledge. So Nessa already mentioned uh, FAIR exchange um, over several years. So we established the Norman Suspect List Exchange in 2015. The Norman database system has, has been growing for, for a few more years than this. MassBank Europe is one of the database system. We have a coupled substance database in the suspect list exchange um, hosted by the Environmental Institute in Slovakia. Uh, Natalia is the webmaster. Uh, Jaro is the president of the entire Norman network, um, but also the, uh, the brains in charge of the Norman database system as well. Within this, we host the Norman suspect list exchange, or we host the data and, uh, and um, provide this to Norman for their website. Um, Hiva in my team is also uh, helping out with this uh, quite extensively at the moment. Uh, this has grown unimaginably since I started this relatively small initiative in 2015. Uh, we had no idea it would turn into the initiative it has today. Um, we now have uh, over 80 lists. Actually, we have over 90, uh, but because our last number is S89 and we start at zero, I thought it was better to leave it at, at just over 80 to avoid confusion. Um, and what you can see here, we have lists around. Um, from anything between 111,000 chemicals all the way through to very small lists of uh, very specific expert knowledge from the environmental community. Um, and each of these lists have their own purpose. Um, we've started also grouping them according to their keywords um, because we have multiple, multiple PFAS lists, multiple pesticide lists. They're being used in different contexts and we're looking at how we can uh, merge these lists into one, which is the Norman uh, Sustat database but also working extensively with other resources to provide this to users in as many forms as possible. Uh, we do also collaborate with the Comtox Chemicals Dashboard and they are a, an extremely good in, information source for toxicology information. Uh, I already mentioned them a little bit earlier. Uh, and as you'll see in this slide, we're also collaborating very closely with PubChem at the moment. Um, 
learning all sorts of stuff about big data and how to deal with uh, incredible numbers of chemicals from them. And uh, in my um, subsequent slides, I'll be showing you all about this story. Um, so we've done extensive efforts, thanks to Jeff, Paul and Evan at PubChem for importing actually the Norman Suspect List Exchange into PubChem. Not only have they imported our list, but they've also been uh, importing a lot of the annotations and this expert knowledge content. Uh, we have a relatively uh, small set of users. Uh, PubChem obviously has millions of users a month. So this has been incredible for us to reach out to a much greater audience. And they have infrastructure that we at Norman um, can't provide. So it's been a win-win uh, both sides. They've also been able to set up a, a suspect list exchange classification. Um, all of these lists with a blue arrow mean we actually have extensive annotation information in a browsable form. And then we have each of the lists uh, one by one uh, afterwards. Uh, why do we do all of this um, is actually to help connect this uh, knowledge through key software like Metfrag. So Metfrag started off as an in silico fragmenter, just this tiny logo here. What we've actually been able to do through the years is connect this up with all of these other resources that I've just mentioned. So we're connecting it to the mass spectral libraries, to the suspect list, to the big databases like PubChem and Comtox. And basically using not just the chemical structures, but also the information coming from these databases to prioritize the identification of substances in our samples. Uh, this example of nicotine is going to follow us all the way through the talk. Uh, so keep your eyes open for, uh, for this as we progress. So this is the first mention of Barbara's name, if she's uh, got her eyes up uh, sharply. So we've been also trying to work on how to communicate open and fair science and how to enable uh, contributors to also provide this data in an easier form so that uh, other resources are able to use it like we've been able to done, uh, do. Uh, I mean, each of the suspect list exchange lists, I know how much work I put into it and PubChem puts into uh, making this public. Um, but if people are able to provide templates in a relatively simple form, it's much easier for us to digest and uh, value add this information. Uh, and yeah, just providing information in a very simple template, so like the one I've got on the screenshot here, can make great things happen. And I'm going to spend the next few slides uh, just giving you a little teaser in terms of environmental analysis. Um, the exchange of information, for instance, this is uh, Nikki Forrest Aligazakis, who's one of the uh, key scientists in, in the Norman network, who's combining a lot of the initiatives together in the database system to uh, present interactive um, data analysis workflows for all of the Norman members. What you see here is uh, actually the retrospective screening of reach chemicals. So we've got the chemicals on the, on the y-axis here in samples occurring in the Black Sea. And what you'll see here with the dashed lines and the icons is we've got um, fish and biota, we've got the water, and we've got the sediments. And what you can start to see from the retrospective screening uh, is that different chemicals are occurring in, in different matrices. So there's no point uh, screening for atrazine in the fish. You're going to see it in the water. And uh, chlorhexidine is uh, definitely something we're seeing in the sediment, but we're not seeing it in either the water or the biota. So we can both find the existing knowledge uh, in our samples, but you can also use uh, these lists to find new knowledge uh, that we didn't necessarily uh, know. Uh, also, for many years, we've actually been doing real-time monitoring of the Rhine River with these non-targeted methods. Uh, and this is daily monitoring efforts, and you can start to see over time the different uh, trends stick out. So we can either detect this was a previously unknown chemical, it's known now, um, but this basically the intensity triggered a threshold. Each of these peaks were actually contributing almost a ton of this chemical in the Rhine River, which is obviously quite a significant amount of chem chemical. You can also do reverse pattern searching. So this was a signal that was happening all the time, so it would be hard to... Um, Hard to stick out until all of a sudden they had a production break and the signal suddenly disappeared. Uh, and again, through this tracking, we were able to uh, go back and find the, um, the company who was responsible, and they were actually very responsible, uh, implemented a mitigation me measure and dramatically reduced the concentrations of this chemical in the Rhine. Um, this is really important. The Rhine River is a source of drinking water for over 20 million people, so uh, we definitely want these real-time monitoring systems happening to catch any uh, any chemical um, spills before it actually gets into the drinking water. The story I'm going to tell a little bit later is uh, Luxpest and the transformation product. So I'm going to run through how this whole FAIR data um, actually helped come to outcomes in this project. And we've also got another example, uh, for instance, the pharmaceuticals in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, this was uh, my postdoc Randolph and PhD student Adeline. We saw some fascinating trends here in the green. You actually see the year 2020, the pharmaceutical concentrations dropped a lot in Luxembourg. We actually have uh, our population doubles during the day 
Um, so when everyone was working from home and in a different country, actually the pharmaceutical load in the country uh, dropped dramatically and some uh, like the uh, contrast media actually dropped out completely because the hospitals were treating uh, COVID patients and they weren't actually doing uh, any diagnosis uh, for quite a while. So our problem in exposomics and answering our questions is which chemicals are relevant and how do we find them? So I mentioned the numbers, we've got CAS with 180 million, it's, it's not an open database for us. So we work closely with PubChem, which is the, um, the biggest open database. Uh, 111, okay, you can argue with ChemSpider now at 114. Um, PubChem enable us to access the data a lot easier. Um, we've got Comptox, we've got PubChem Lite, we've got the suspect list exchange around 113,000. And how do we find them? So this is where some, some more terminology comes in. We've got the target analysis, which is looking for a, a very narrow selection of chemicals, but very accurately. We've got the suspect screening. So these lists of chemicals that I was talking about where if we're interested in finding from uh, pharmaceuticals or pesticides, we just look for um, pesticides or pharmaceuticals in a certain list. Or we've got non-target screening where we try to really look at everything. The risk is of course, uh, or however we measure it, there's always some chemicals escaping our attention. So we have uh, a lot of identification strategies. Um, our, the best one target screening. So what I was saying with the narrow range, this is really limited by reference standard availability. So we do a lot of this suspect screening. Uh, we have um, level two probable structures with mass bank. Uh, so this was the fingerprinting I was talking about, or we have MetFrag to give us tentative candidates based on in silico methods. And then we have the dark matter that's uh, a massive interest or maybe a formula, but we don't have any, any structural information. Part of our challenge is to move between these different levels and gather as much evidence as possible uh, for an identification of a chemical so that we can actually come to conclusions. All right, so I've talked way too long in the introduction, so I'm gonna try and speed up a bit. Uh, so I'll give you a brief introduction to METFRAG. This is a lot of slides, but I'm gonna um, run through it quickly. METFRAG is basically an in silico fragmenter. Uh, from a mass spectrometer, we, we get a, um, an exact mass. We have an error margin. We have an error margin on the fragmentation information. We query a database like PubChem with this exact mass. We have the fingerprint or the fragmentation information, and we get a list of ranked candidates out according to how well the candidates, the in silico fragmentation predicts, uh, matches the observed. Our biggest challenge here is that MS and MSMS information alone is not enough. So if we just have this information with PubChem and uh, Metfrag, we have less than 10% of our chemicals ranked correctly in first place. So if you're thinking high throughput workflows like, like uh, Nissa was talking about earlier, this is not a very good success rate. And if you want to look at our example of nicotine, basically if we're putting nicotine, the formula of nicotine in, then it's coming out somewhere in the bottom one third of the candidates, which is not so cool because nicotine is out there and we know it's gonna be, uh, quite often it's gonna be the correct candidate. So we relaunched Metfrag in 2016. We added a whole lot more functionality element selection, substructure information, retention time information. We added metadata from PubChem literature and patents. We added Comtox and all of their metadata. We added suspect list functionality so you could restrict it to certain lists of chemicals as well. More importantly, we also, well, just as important, we also added the connection to the documented mass spectra so that we could actually do a live lookup with, uh, with actual experimental mass spectra as well and come straight to a level two A identification. So the good news of this was all of these efforts were definitely worth it. We got from less than 10% to around about 71% of our um, data set ranked correctly in first place. So this is a much better success rate for thinking about high throughput uh, identification methods of um, mass spectrometry data. So if we take our uh, case of nicotine again with PubChem, you can see now nicotine is clearly ranked in first place. Um, but our challenge is that we have almost 3000 candidates for this mass. So basically, as PubChem was growing, as the databases were growing, our identification performance was dropping, even though our method was still just as good, but just sheer numbers of chemicals, and our run times were rising a lot. So for a 20-minute analytical run, it was taking us over a day to do the identification of this sample. And that's not scaling. If you're getting data in 20 minutes, you want the data analysis to be also running in 20 minutes or less. So our challenge is that the chemical space was too big. So even if we would take Comtox chemicals dashboard, say the 900,000, uh, at the stage this figure was made, it was the 800,000 collection. Even then we had 138 candidates. So we were taking a look at this and we're basically, you can split it up into candidates with high information content. We know they're out there, they're likely to be found in the environment. 
And then we've still got this long tail of candidates with low information content. And for Comtox, this is around, uh, yeah, well, it's most of the data set. For PubChem, this was several thousand candidates. For Comtox, it's a, a hundred or so. So this is where Evan and I had a lot of very, very interesting discussions uh, over many weeks and months and now years. Uh, we were basically, okay, can we break PubChem down into the useful bits for the environmental community? And we took a look at the PubChem table of contents. This basically breaks down uh, the contents of the PubChem records. And already we were kind of thinking, okay, let's try and make a data set around about the size of 200,000. And if that doesn't help, let's go for one of about 2 million. Um, turns out our first draft uh, performant uh, better than we could ever imagine. In the yellow you see here, we kind of looked at the categories that were relevant for environmental information. So we avoided categories with uh, millions, but we tried to stick to the small ones. And for each of these categories, there's actually a whole tree behind it so that you can see not only is this an agrochemical, but who provided this information and what information is in there. And if this uh, chemical is actually in the tree, it means that there's this accompanying record uh, in the individual record as well. So you can really find out what the information is. Uh, and this exists for every single category. So you see use in manufacturing, we have uh, a lot more categories involved. This really depends on, on the data set. But in terms of environmental interpretation, this is extremely useful because we can already go back to the reference and see, okay, this is, uh, this is what's happened. Uh, where we also added in the biomolecular interactions and pathways for our metabolomics friends. Uh, obviously, this is something they like. So this is where um, all the HMDB, RIA, and all of this data is included. And then for exposomics, we added associated disorders and diseases and identification. Uh, and it turns out, even though you would add up the numbers, you get way over uh, 400,000. You actually get close to uh, 600,000. Um, but when you collapse this all together and uh, group them by inch key first block, we ended up with a data set of around 370,000. And I'm saying it's approximately 370,000 because PubChem changes daily. Um, and we basically made this into a di dynamic collection that's basically rebuilding itself every week. And as PubChem grows and as the annotation content grows, so is PubChem Lite as well. So any new chemicals added to these information categories go into our latest collection. So we're now uh, at over 380,000. Uh, what's been good about this workflow is that we can also deposit this collection on Zenodo. And this has been one of our challenges for reproducible research is PubChem is such a dynamic and moving database is we basically can't reproduce our queries unless we archive all of the candidate files, which over time just gets to be an incredible amount of data. Um, but if we have this collection archived, then we can basically create a much more compact reproducible um, script that can be automatically rerun uh, using the direct link in the Zenodo repository. So we've been able to create archives and much more um, uh, dynamic and, and small reproducible workflows. This also means with a single pull request, I can update the PubChem Lite collection in Metfrag and everyone who uses Metfrag via the web interface can use the latest and greatest version. I can use it in the teaching straight away. Uh, and anyone who uses Metfrag and the command line can also download the uh, the data from Zenodo and, and use this directly as well. So we have a lot fewer and much more relevant candidates and we are also able to provide the context. So here again is our nicotine example. You can see now we've got 37 candidates instead of uh, almost uh, 3000. Uh, we've got pretty much all of the high information content ones. We're still providing our favorite scores, the literature and the patents, which helps capture popular chemicals and, and industrial chemicals. And we're also providing an annotation type count, which tells you how many of these annotation categories actually contributed to this chemical being in this collection. Um, you can add the individual categories as well, and this can really help direct your analysis to just pesticides, just pharmaceuticals, if you wish to subset it. So how does this influence the performance? Um, we did the first evaluation and we were stunned um, because we've absolutely brutalized PubChem into a fraction of the size, and we still ended up improving our performance to 80%. And this was really through the reduction of, uh, of the candidates, uh, plus this uh, additional information. And what was really important for us is not only did we have 80% ranked in first place, but we also had 90% ranked either first or second. So this means for high throughput workflows, your top two or three candidates are um, pretty much covering most of the known chemicals that are out there. Of course, if you chop a database into pieces, uh, you're gonna <laughs> be at the risk of missing uh, quite a few key candidates and indeed this happened to us. This is where we came back to the Roman suspect list exchange. 
because we basically saw very quickly that uh, what was missing was the transformation products and, and they were in PubChem, but they weren't annotated as being relevant uh, uh, chemicals in PubChem. So these were always the ones that were very hard for us to find. So what did we do? We started using our data sets and the expert knowledge to provide this information in the PubChem records in an um, easier way for the people to find it. So we started adding transformations as the reactions. So this is both a machine readable and human readable format. You can download these files so the machines can read it, but we present it in a nice table that uh, humans can appreciate. Uh, and this went straight into the pharmacology and biochemistry section of PubChem Light. And we also, where we had it, added these um, snippets of information into the relevant categories as well. So for instance, the agrochemical information we had in these lists went into agrochemical categories, which also went into PubChem Light. So when we started adding these data sets, we could see that PubChem Light was gradually growing. Uh, so when we added S60 in May, uh, we closed the gap a little bit. When we added S66 and S68, uh, we closed the gap a whole lot more. You can still see we have a few things missing, but these were pretty much single uh, hits in different lists, and we didn't have the sufficiently good annotation content to add them in any meaningful way, let's just say. So how do we actually apply this? There's an awful lot of work of putting data out there, but how does this actually help us? Um, so again, which chemicals are relevant to us? And I'm going to present the little case of Luxembourg. So we have Philip Diederich. Uh, who's responsible for our routine monitoring, the target and analysis of the water samples and reporting it to the EU, which is uh, our obligation under EU law. Um, and he reached out to us because of course, we want to know what else is out there that's not necessarily covered by the regulations. Um, so he was providing us the samples and we were doing the suspect screening to see what's, what's in there that we need to keep an eye out on. Uh, and here is uh, Jessie's master's thesis. So uh, first off, we were super lucky to get Jessie because she's Luxembourgish. Uh, and we had information on pesticides in Luxembourg in four languages, including uh, a huge amount of handwritten documents. Uh, so she was actually able to work up all of these and not only get them into English and chemical structures, but also get this into a suspect list uh, for us to use. So this is S69 on, on an Ormond suspect list exchange. She then went through the, um, the screening with shiny screen to extract the data. And you can see here the months that we had. So we had samples from April to October. And you can see here the big peak in July. And so this chemical was pretty much coming up uh, with its main concentration in July. She was then extracting the annotation. And for the sake of her thesis, we really concentrated on level two. So the, um, the spectra that had a very high quality match in mass bank, we knew there were a lot of uh, spectra from EOAG. So this is Sammy, that's how you present him pronounce EOAG. I know it's a really difficult uh, name. Uh, and they were measured with exactly the same instrument as ours. So we knew if we got a very good match, uh, it was highly likely to be right. So of our 386 pesticides in her suspect list, we found tentative hits for 162 and 36 of these we were able to annotate at this very high level um, mass spectral match. And then based on these, because we only wanted to uh, prioritize those where we had quite a good match, we then went back to PubChem to extract the transformation and metabolism information. Uh, and I'm going to run through this in the next slides, but we basically ended up with 182 transformation products that belonged with these 36, and then 135 of these uh, potentially matching with other masses. And we did this through the transformations that I've already um, let you know about, but we also went through to look at some of their literature extracted information as well, because we noticed that a lot of this had useful information, but we didn't yet have the transformations in the suspect list exchange. So what we were doing, um, PubChem actually run a um, a synonym recognition uh, text, re uh, text mining on, on their records. We were able to extract this from the JSON. Of course, what we can extract easily is the CIDs that match with the synonyms that are correctly recognized. What we needed the expert knowledge for was descriptions like hydrolysis of the chlorine moiety, which for us, we know that's the chlorine is being replaced by hydroxy, but the text mining algorithms aren't good enough to capture that yet. So, so we were working up both at the same time. And uh, creating, extracting the data, uh, feeding it back to PubChem in the machine readable format, um, adding in the new structures uh, in the to a deposition at the same time. So we added a fair few new CIDs with this effort. Uh, and we gave it back to the users, this nice transformation table here, a couple of the new um, structures that we were able to add. Uh, so the information was already in PubChem, but we could uh, value add it and give it back to the user in a slightly different format that was easier for machines to process. So not only do we have uh, the transformations in PubChem, 
but we were also able to use this to automatically connect the transformation products in water. So here we've got terbutalazine and a couple of its transformation products. What you can see here from the visualization is the top and the bottom plots, they both match with the green. And even though the transformation products in the middle two, they match with the chromatography and they match with what we'd expect, you can see the month is a different month. So if it would be connected to this parent, we would expect uh, everything to be green. So not only are we getting the evidence of the masses connecting but and, and the shifts in the retention time, but you also get the, the visualization to help see if the timing also makes sense. Why are we so interested in this? What you can see from, from her results is that we have uh, a fair few of the verified and quantified identifications are actually the transformation products. So we know that these chemicals are transformed in the environment. We know we have to do a better job of uh, finding them. Um, why do we still want to do more? So just um, I'm just noticing the time. I think I'll manage to get through everything. Our challenge is really this dark matter and mass spectrometry. So this is a um, a figure from 2015, but it still very much holds. The known spectra will cover about 2% of our data sets, and we still need to find out this dark matter. It's uh, highly likely that a lot of this dark matter is actually the transformations. So again, here we've got uh, PubChem Light. We're almost at 380,000 in this collection. If we would put this through the best uh, prediction right now, the open prediction by a transformer, um, we've got 2.4 to 1.2 million. If we put it through uh, a combination of human and environment, because what comes in the environment, it often goes into wastewater treatment. You've got a combination of it having been through humans already, but then hitting the environment and other microbial uh, digestion. So you do theoretically get these mixtures uh, coming into the environment. If we would do multiple generations of environmental transformation. You can see already in five generations, we're almost about the size of PubChem again. If we only do three generations of mixed uh, uh, mixed reactions, we're also around about the size of PubChem. So what's going to be very important for us as a community in the next few years is getting more data into uh, the open resources into a fair format so that we can constrain this combinatorial exploration with more data that really defines how these reactions happen so that we can not only add to the reactions, but also help predict the, the likelihoods and constrain um, the generation. We've been doing a lot of efforts for this as well. So uh, these are the Norman suspect lists that we've been working on. Um, Dejun has also been working on the Campbell data set, which is a very large one. So to date, we've got already uh, entries on transformations for over 6,000 CIDs. Uh, what's good about this is this has already doubled the Biotransformer library. Uh, so the Biotransformer library is one of our data sets. It's about 3,000 uh, of the CIDs. Uh, so we're hoping they'll be able to use what we've been doing uh, to increase their work as well. Uh, what we've also been able to do is by providing these to PubChem, we can also read all of this data out again, again, deposit it on Zenodo so that we have a permalink. And this enables, again, fair workflows to take this data at a static point um, and then integrate this into other workflows. So Rick has been doing a, a great job with this. As soon as we give uh, put new data out on Zenodo, he will grab it and integrate it into Patron. We've just submitted uh, version two. Uh, what he's doing is taking the known transformations from PubChem and from other resources. Um, he's also integrating the uh, prediction like Biotransformer, and this basically means there's an open source workflow for us to interpret our data using no knowledge where we have it, using predicted knowledge uh, where this can help, and hopefully this will help people observe and be able to feed us uh, these fair data sets so that we can improve the knowledge out there in the open space. So with this, uh, it looks like I did manage to hold my time. I just want to finish off with some take home messages. So finding small molecules is big data. Um, I hope I've been able to convince you that an open and fair expert knowledge exchange is critical to this. Um, there's so much information out there. Um, we need machines to be able to deal with it. Uh, we have a lot of different open source workflows with automated QC, but with the possibility for manual review uh, so that we can uh, enable this data analysis a lot quicker. We have comprehensive and open annotation that's been enabled by resources like Metfrag and MassBank. We've done a lot of work on metabolites, uh, both putting data out there, uh, working with literature mined data, um, but also enhancing visualization and interpretation so that we can improve this knowledge further. Uh, outcomes of this means we can actually continue our efforts for improved monitoring of chemicals and hopefully also actions resulting from our results, both in Luxembourg and around the world, because we're creating open resources that we hope will help people beyond Philip and his monitoring efforts. We've also been able to uh, put 
a small collection together that has really enabled uh, us to go from days of calculations to minutes worth of calculation and really helps the community find well-known chemicals in their data sets much more efficiently. Uh, working with people like Rick has been amazing because he can basically take our data sets, integrate it and uh, put it into an open source workflow that's already being used by you know, Dutch drinking water companies to ensure the quality of water, um, for instance, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And we're hoping many others will start using this software as well. Uh, so we're already developing methods that are out there and in use. Uh, and if any of you want to try out what we've been doing, uh, Rick has in extensive installation instructions with test data sets. He's already integrated PubChem Lite, uh, Metric being long integrated. Uh, he's got the transformation workflows and uh, would be delighted for any feedback and more users. Just finally, I know Nessa said uh, <laughs> she, she, people are sick of her banging on about FAIR. Well, I'm going to be doing it as well. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate, expert knowledge is your knowledge. Um, so if, if you provide your information in a fair template or in an easy way for machines to process, then that knowledge gets out there and gets used uh, a lot quicker. So we had already a, um, an article and a reply in the Journal of Chem Informatics uh, supporting this for chemical structures. We've just had our article accepted that, uh, for the expo zone that also describes how to um, provide fair transformations to include this uh, data set as well. And we're hoping to keep this uh, series of articles going uh, with the next set of journals as well. With that, uh, thank you very much for putting up with me for so long. Uh, I hope I was able to entertain you. Uh, look out for us on Twitter. Um, you can always send me an email. Please download the slides uh, from Zenodo. I hope they're a uh, useful and interesting resource for you. Thank you to all of the wonderful people who have helped make this happen. Uh, I could not do it without them. And thank you to all of you for listening.